I've got uh, two local artists here today, Tim Napier and Dave Sears. They're both uh, well known in the area, mm -hmm. and uh, Tim has had his woodwork in the gift shop for many years. And Dave, he, if you live in Cameron, you may not know Dave, but I'm sure you've seen him out there taking photographs of, at every community yeah, event. Mean. I wanted to ask you, Tim, just a little bit about yourself and uh, how it is you ended up living here in Pemberton. Well, I came to Pemberton in July of 1985 uh, to work with Mike O'Neill, who had a forestry consulting company, and became for a while, pretty much with him, the, the only engineering forester in, in, in the Pemberton area. And then gradually, other companies started bringing their own in or expanding. So in the early days, it was just you and Mike? Pretty well. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, I mean, the, the larger companies, Interfor, had their own that they would, they would send up from the city. Yeah. But for the licensees in, in the valley, I was it <laughs> for, for a few years. And before you came to Pemberton, you lived in Victoria? Yes, I spent uh, about 20 years in, in Victoria, so I've now been in Pemberton for a longer period than, than I was in Victoria. Uh, I got to Victoria when I was seven years old and um, left there, well, left there when I started going to university. And you told me you were actually born in London, England? That's right. I yeah. was bo born in London, England. My father was with Shell Oil Company. When I was born, I was taken, I think, via Canada uh, to Jamaica. And then when I was, I think, three, we moved to Puerto Rico. And we were in Puerto Rico for three years and then moved to Venezuela after that. Then my father took an early retirement. So you, can, so you consider yourself somewhat uh, retired now that you're in Pemberton, your world traveling days are over? Well, different things. I wanted to spend more time with my parents and um, so basically so I got out of forestry, but forestry was sort of declining. It was, the industry was just in dire straits. It was very difficult. Um, if I wanted to hire somebody good, I'd have to pay them a lot more than I was paying myself. And it was like... This was in the early 90s then? Y yes, in the early 90s, yes. That's when things started to decline? Yes. Yeah. Now you said what set you off down the road of woodworking again was that you base. Yes. Well, one of the last times I walked on Willows Beach in Victoria, I looked down, at, I was with, with my mother, and I looked down and I saw that somebody had hacked a piece of yew out of their garden. And what it had was, there was, you know, roots that were hacked off, a sort of root ball, and then all these branches sticking out. So I had to drive around, throw it in the back of the truck, and then uh, a couple of months later, this, this was the result. And you, if you look closely, you can see all the the, the, the branches where, where they came up and grew together. And, then, and of course, this, this is where the, the, the roots were at the bottom. Uh, and I did with it is I had um, heard about the use of polyethylene glycol, PEG as it's known. You actually put it in a warm bath of, of PEG and leave it there. I think I left it in it for three weeks or a month or something, and I took it out, drained it as well as I could, and I put it in the oven at a low temperature for another two weeks. <laughs> but when I, when I got this one lathe and then realized how much value was in all the accessories and extra pieces, and I, you know, I was very proud of, of my acquisition, so I was telling people about it, and um, Bob Menzel said, I have a big old lathe out in the field. <laughs> and I looked at it, I said, no way. After about a month of him telling me that he had it out in the field, I went and looked. Now also, when I, when I was with Bob, uh, he sort of pointed and he says, oh, and he says, there's a bandsaw over there. And I said, where? And he says, there. And I looked and there was this piece of little corner of metal sticking out. It took me an entire winter of 
oiling them and tapping at them to get them to move again. Uh, a bull lathe that somebody had for sale in the Lower Mainland, and uh, Deborah said, I'll buy it for you. Uh, uh, this lathe had been cr created in this uh, machine shop. shop they made wooden um, prototypes, as it were, for casting in, in steel or iron. So they built this thing because they had to make an eight foot diameter flywheel for a rock crusher. And um, so this was all custom built. The, 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 the face plate is 35 inches in, in diameter on that thing. I, you know, I mean, it's, it's got a massive shaft in it. And when, when, they, when they were using, you know, when they had to leave it overnight, they had to put a, a chain and, and chain it back to the uh, top corner in the building or else it would bend that shaft overnight. <laughs> so it was used for one project and they never used it again and they, they said it's taking up space, take it away. Uh, when I was trying to find out about this the bandsaw and the lathe, it, had, it was from the Galt Machine Works. And, uh, contacted the uh, archivist and uh, he sent me diagrams from the 1910 um, catalog from Galt Machine Works but I think because of the, the way mine is built it's an earlier model oh. so <laughs> it's, it's about 1900 it's, it's just to show the different stages um, this was a cottonwood elbow or stump, curved stump that was in the ditch line by Country Meadows. And Hydro cut the tree down and left the stump and Harry said, hey, do you want the stump? So, mm -hmm. okay, I got talked into it. So, this is what I started with and if you roll down, you'll see the different stages and then finally I got it onto the lathe. As it happens, that big old lathe has a uh, a block of wood you can pull out so that it acts as a gap lathe which allows you to put a 24 inch diameter thing on instead of something smaller. So then if you go back up, um, you know, you can see the massive amount of wet shavings because I did this when it was wet. Very stinky cotton, you know, cottonwood is very stinky stuff when it's wet. And uh, then once I had it sh uh, shaped, I then wrapped it in about four layers of paper, taped it all up, and then put it um, curbside or open side down on a shelf and left it for six months to, to dry, but the paper to slow down the drying process. Okay. Now what happens then is it will, it will shrink a little bit, so it, you know, it, would, it would rock around a bit, but then I trued the it turned it over and then trued the bottom and then sanded the whole thing down. And if you could uh, keep rolling. And do you always have the carpet when it's wet, cottonwood? No. Uh, no, you don't have to. It's, it's softer when it's wet. Um, I'm, I've tried different woods when they're wet. Um, I've, in, in the corner you see that big piece is an oak piece. Now that was from a, a dead standing oak tree in Victoria. And I thought, well, it shouldn't move much. But once, once I had the thing shaped, it ended up with a massive crack in it because it, it shrank. Mm -hmm. And it, it shrank so peripherally around the, the, the middle. Uh, fruit wood is notoriously bad for uh, cracking, splitting, just because it's it's quite it's, it's quite dense. It's got a lot of moisture in it, so it's a little touch and go. Why did you want to restore equipment from 1900 and use it? Well, it it, it was an opportunity to um, end up with. A large piece of equipment for a reasonable price. I wanted to ask you about 
the wood that you find. Now, when you were working as a forester, did you just squirrel away all this information, where this was and where that was, and, and now you just go on your walkabouts, or, or are you always surprised by things that you find, like the you for the vase? Or? Yeah, well, I mean, this, this one, for example, was a, it's a balsam girl, and I had seen it when I was working in the Upper Lillooet, so I went out one weekend and got it, painted it, and I had that for 15 years before I did anything with it. <laughs> so some of your creations are a long time emerging, and, and some come out a little bit quicker. That's right. Yeah. Well, it's you know, I mean, for for example, on the on the table here, I've got a a goose that I'm carving out of a piece of bird. Um, but I got to a sort of stage, and then it was okay. I got to know the shape of the head of the, the goose before I get any further. So I haven't touched it for <laughs> a few years. <laughs> I wanted to ask you about the laminate that you're using because I get a lot of questions about that when you uh, put those kinds of items in the gift shop. It, it's kind of neat to use some um, different materials. Uh, this this one is, is effectively very thick plywood. And this is what they call micro lamb. They make beams out of it, structural beams out of it. So construction sites sometimes have bits. And that doesn't just all fly apart when you're lathing it. It, it can't. Was done, was done on the lathe. Now, it's very, very striking. Uh, well, this is called Paralam. And it's shards of plywood veneer that are put into a, 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 a mold, as it were, shaken to orient them in the more or less the same direction. Then they add a resin, and then under heat and pressure, they make um, parallel beams. Now, they, these beams can be you know, six feet deep and <laughs> whatever size. So, um, I, I do have one bigger bowl of this diameter. Uh, what's really interesting is this is a naturally spalted piece of, of um, birch, I think. But you look at it, and it looks almost identical. This is man-made, or so uh, re reconstituted. This is natural. So it's, it's pretty. This was a very unusually dark cedar burl, whereas this one here, which is in process, is uh, you know I've sort of sanded it to about. 80 grit or something, but I've got to go down, to, you know, go to 220 and then go to 400. But this is much lighter in color than that one. So 400 grit is what you get your pieces to. That's what I like to go to. Because I, I, used, I started off at 220 and then no, yeah. 400. What a difference! Do you sand them all by hand? Uh, what's what's by hand? I'm, I'm guiding the sandpaper. With it. <laughs> these are what are called bandsaw boxes, and this, these are made from black walnut. Sp spatulas are made out of Gary Oak from Victoria. You said you put the liquid pig on. Well, that was on the vase, and that was the vase only. Oh, okay. I, I it's used. not something you do always. It's not something I do always. Um, it's something one could consider with, like, fruit wood, because it will displace the water and replace it with. It's a sort of very waxy substance. So then, it, then it, it would stabilize the wood. Um, it's just a a pain to use and it's uh, difficult to get in large quantities. Yeah. Now, my, my preferred um, treatment on these is this Clapham's uh, beeswax and mineral oil. Um, that was going to be my last Salable finish. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, it is edible. <laughs> you know, that's number one. And it, if you sand to 400 grit, and then you, when you put that on, it just it has a nice warm glow. Mm -hmm. is, is that what we have on the dock for all the other? 
these wax? This, this actually was, uh, I had somebody lacquer it for me, spray, sprayed lacquer on it to give it a sort of wetter look. <laughs> how do you, well, how do you look after it for a, to ensure that it lasts a long time? So it's about the wax and yeah. not leaving it in a puddle of water. So uh, the formal name of uh, Tim's company is Wild Bulls. So you see them out at the Christmas Bazaar or uh, in the museum gift shop here. Well, we do have that short video that we played for you today on the museum website, and I hope that you'll join us in promoting Tim's work because he uh, has been in our gift shop for many years. I've got an even bigger piece of birch that's, I think, about that diameter and six and a half feet tall. And I, that was, I was going to make a coat rack out of that, but now I have decided I think what I want to do is, is cut a curved door in it and make basically make a playhouse out of it. Put some windows. <laughs> in I grew up in Ottawa, um, our nation's capital. Uh, went to high school and university there, moved to Whistler in about 1976, um, lived there for a number of years. I left Whistler when I thought it was getting crazy nuts. I moved to Pemberton, like I said, about 22 years ago, and just fell in love with the place. I couldn't believe what an amazing you know, place both the town was and also just the entire surrounding area. And, and quite frankly, I thought if you know, people ask, would you have moved back to Whistler? And I would never move back to Whistler. I can't imagine why you want to live in Whistler anymore. So that's sort of the really short version. The ability to have old pictures like that, I think, is so incredibly cool. That's Honey Harbor, where they had a, uh, a cottage, and, you know, I mean, that's the prototypical Canadian picture, right? It, it, that's Canadian, really. That's Georgian Bay, right? Yeah, yeah, Georgian Bay. Um, that picture. I don't know much about it. You find pictures in boxes in your parents' attic and stuff like that. I wish I knew more. And that's part of the charm, I think, of old pictures as you look at them and try to figure out who are these guys and what were they? Well, I know what they're doing and posing their cricketers, but where and why and what? Those are some awesome mustaches. Yeah, but most of our family photos, if they're not posed, have fish in them <laughs> one way or another. So my grandfather, my grandfather at work. I used to work at the Saturday night, and my family has sort of a long history of being journalists. Grandfathers, great-grandfathers, my parents both worked for the Toronto Telegram, um, and a little bit of it might have rubbed off on me, I think. I actually studied journalism and photojournalism, although I didn't head in that direction. I ended up taking an English degree because I wanted something, you know, really marketable. <laughs> <laughs> That's my grandmother. I think she might have been a flapper, I'm not sure. Um, same thing, just... Fishing. Fishing, yeah. <laughs> I, I think that picture is just charming just because of those big loaves of bread that she's sitting, yeah. you know, behind. Um, this our house in Ottawa. When I was about eight years old, I had a dark room in the basement of that thing. Um, my cousin was a photographer for one of the big photo stringer places, UP, I think it was, and he kind of got us involved a little more deeply than we probably would have been as as little kids. So my brother and I had a dark room in the basement and we used to play with, um, you could only develop black and white films, so it was all plus X and tri -X, but it was a whole lot of fun. We quite enjoyed it. It's sort of magic that you don't really get anymore of having to spend time threading the film onto a spindle in the dark and then putting chemicals in it and agitating it and waiting and waiting and waiting and then fixing it and then rinsing it and then finally getting to pull it out to see if you even got anything. <laughs> Um, and I take pictures of anything. <laughs> so the thing about Ottawa, like I said, was the, this was a visit that I took a few years ago. I had to, you know, take all the cliche pictures, right? So it's Parliament Hill. But the thing is, where I grew up was so permanent. You know, Ottawa didn't change a lot. The National Capital Commission has done a really good job sort of preserving that history. And it's, you know, I mean, they're not going to change that. It's going to be around for a while, probably. And it's just a town full of stuff like that. Oh, Although that is a new art gallery and it's quite spectacular. Um, but Parliament Hill through it. And they do some weird things in Ottawa too. <laughs> <laughs>
That's, that was our church. I was a choir boy in that church. But the thing I like about this picture is somebody spent a lot of time carving praise the Lord here. But he spelled praise, P-R-A. Yeah. So, the other thing I like about pictures is Sometimes they're like onions and you can sort of peel back different layers and, and they represent things that you aren't initially aware of. And these pictures, that's my grandmother and grandfather, were in these sort of funny frames. And I'd always kind of wondered why and what, what that was all about. My mom took me to the National Archives um, a few years ago when I was visiting Ottawa. And I read my grandfather's diary during the First World War. And one of the pages said, Next. Mackenzie crashed me. Strange to say, he had no wind up. His engine conked just as we took off, and then he throttled on again. We missed a haystack, but a large manure pile put us right up on our nose. <laughs> <laughs> I claimed two blades of the prop. The other two were splintered to pieces. And that's what the rain was in. Yeah. And that's what those are. To me, just the idea that those things were actually somewhere in a field in 1916 in France, you know, it's just, it's amazing. And then how I got to Whistler, well, that's my mom, and that's my dad. So I, I was skiing for as long as I could remember, really. And when I moved to Whistler, um, you know, in 1976, it was a completely different place than it is now. And you know, that's the view from the Alpine office, so, I don't know, early 80s maybe, but the Roundhouse, you know, I mean, the Roundhouse, Tower 18, that's yeah, yeah. gone. Um, that's during the Great Race, actually. And that represents a moment in time, that's this staff party in 1986, in the springtime. And the significance of that is simply that they put in the peak chair that summer. And never again did you have to use that traverse to get up onto the peak, which a lot of people think is still a shame, but it's progress. There aren't a lot of, you know, Whistler buildings left sort of from that era, partly because I was on the fire department in the 80s and helped burn them all down. <laughs> that's the Mount Whistler Lodge on Alka Lake. No. Oh, that's the Alka Lake. That's the old fire. Mount Whistler Lodge. Oh, that's that's Rudy's, yeah, actually. There. Yeah, we didn't actually, they were going to ventilate the roof. Yeah, well, <laughs> by the time they got around to thinking about that, it was way too late in the game. It was the top of the mountain, and those are the two green drives. This is green drive one, green drive two. Well, actually, I'm not sure. I was never sure which one was one and which was two. But they were there for forever, and then one day they were gone. Now, the cool thing about that is he ended up in Pemberton. Yeah. 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 No, that's down Poplar Street. It's Kevin yeah. Savall's house. I've seen that. Yeah, that, was, that, that. His house is actually the old two green drives. Oh, really? I shot pictures in Whistler, but, you know, in the 70s, you couldn't even get film developed in Whistler. So it was kind of a pain to do. I mostly started shooting Kodachrome because he had to mail that away, and it made no difference. I must well mail it away to the States somewhere. Wherever, wherever it was going, the online pictures were in boxes with no organization, nothing, just, oh, I'll get to those one day. <laughs> and one day I actually did, and I started scanning them and looking at them and, and realizing, wow, there's a lot of stuff here, wow, I have a picture of this. And I also realized, oh, if I knew now what I knew then, yeah. I, I probably would have taken more pictures. I don't have a picture of Dusty the Horse, you know, I wish I did. Oh. After I did that, I started thinking, well, I do have the opportunity here to sort of take more pictures. So I thought I would. And it's still the same kind of thing, you know, that growth and change seems to be sort of almost exponential. It starts slowly and there's a little change here and a little change here. And before you know it, it kind of snowballs and you look around and everything's changed. That's the mine under the Lilac Hill in the Barber Valley. That's the Lilac Hill on the inside. You know, and I thought of gold mine at 5,000 feet, winter and all summer, apparently. You know, and you drag a, a, a stove, an iron stove, up to oh, that elevation, I'm sure you want the heat, but just getting it there must have been quite a feat. And then stuff, you know, that's the airport. Uh, <laughs> airport flood? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it floods. 
<laughs> it gets it from both directions, yeah, the yellow yeah, and yeah, the yeah, green. Yeah. Yeah. You see the causeway, <laughs> the road. Oh my oh, Is this the 2003 thing? Yeah. yeah. I, you know, I can't remember. I'd have to check. New stuff, you know. Yeah. Even now, the community center, you kind of think, you're so used to seeing it, it's been there for a long time. It's sort of part of the scenery, but it really hasn't been around for no, that long. <laughs> and then, you know, the things that go through the valley, too. You don't see a lot of elk in Pemberton, but there was at least one in the last couple of years. Um, I'm with Search and Rescue here, too, and that's gotten me into a lot of places that I never would have gotten to on my own. You know, really sort of grateful for that. And this is one of those. That's Paul Vedic, if you remember him. Hollywood, they called him. Um, and that's actually, unfortunately, the guy up here had had a terminal medical incident the day before, unrelated to skiing, just medical. And all we were there for is to go and, and basically bring him back. That guy has a broken back, so. He looks happy because he's not lying on the snow anymore. But... <laughs> and then just the opportunity, the helicopter time is what I really like because oh, could I afford to fly around in a helicopter and take pictures? Yeah. Uh, but this gives me the opportunity to do that. That's Tundra Lake, which is still one of the most amazing lakes I've ever seen just for color. And that's not some um, weird developing or anything, that's the color of that lake. I don't know what minerals make it look like that, but there is remarkable. And then, you know, if you have to call a dive team, it's probably not going to be a successful outcome. That was the year that those three cars went into the lake down at the south end of Lillooet Lake, one after another. Yeah. I think they've now straightened out that corner, but if, if, as I remember in all three cases, that wasn't a happy ending. Uh, uh, that's, you know, just before the forest fires, so the sun sunsets were just gorgeous. And that shot up, that's across the Van Lannes field with Martin's field there. Yeah, and the, the smoke gives it that color. Oh my God. And then the fire started. And you see, the problem is for a photographer, you're almost kind of going. <laughs> Simply because the images can be just you know, so crazy. And then that, of course, is the landslide from last year, which is something, you know, we're still almost tell me, we were flying up there after we'd seen it, the pilot turned to us and said, biblical. <laughs> The whole mountain let go, that's the slide path there, through there, but it broke here on the front face and everything just slid to the valley. 40 million cubic meters of Mount Meager. And that was a couple of weeks ago. We were in a search for the Ston, in the Ston, for a guy that went in there on a vision quest and we landed at this place called Rediscovery Camp. There's nobody around, not a soul, on the picnic table, the carved owl bear in progress, chair, carving tools. Just for fun, I threw in pictures that I took like, probably in the last week. So we all know what that is. We all know where that is. That's probably the most photographed and painted mm -hmm. little <laughs> yeah. spot in the whole valley. Um, that was the fresh snow we had the other day. Wasn't that nice? Oh, oh I didn't see it. Um, that's that huge river. It's a monster avalanche. And that's it. But, you know, all I can say is anybody who doesn't think anything happens in Pemberton should try taking pictures of it. <laughs> I have a question. Yes. So based on your photography from the slide and the major thing that happened in the fall, what is your prediction for future in the next eight months here, can you <laughs> I mean, you saw it. You mean in terms of what's going to happen with the landslide? Correct. The area still looks like the face of the moon when you're on that fan. It's really quite remarkable what it looks like up there. You know, these weird, huge dirt deposits that I'm not sure whether they were left when the, when the, there were big chunks of ice the size of pickup trucks because the glacier came down for the ride with it. 
they might have melted over there. Uh, it's I think that it's as stable as Mount Meager ever is for the time being. Um, one geotech told me that 40 million cubic meters of material came down. There was another million cubic meters of hang fire still up there, which sounds like an awful amount to you compare to 40 million, I guess. I just wanted to ask you about um, your photography in the sense that sometimes your photos almost look like watercolors. And how are you out seeking certain kinds of light, or how do you get these these effects with your photos? Well, with photography, the most important thing is light. Like nothing's more important. I mean, your subject is obviously really important to you, but you have to combine the right light with it. And sometimes it's a matter of luck. Sometimes it's a matter of just sitting there waiting for the light to change. Um, but there are different ways to process pictures. One thing, it was true with negatives, but it's certainly true now. You know, pictures don't lie. Hell yeah, they do. You can make a picture look like anything you want it to look like. You can take people out of pictures. You can put people in pictures. Um, you can change the background. You can change the lighting. It's quite remarkable what you can do. And I'm not that good at it. I watch some people and it's just astonishing. For some photographs, like for instance, that one of the sunset that looked kind of I was like gonna, a painting, sort of. I was going to pull up the one of the Penn Valley. Yeah, it's the same thing. Um, cameras, especially digital cameras, only see about eight EV steps, they're called, which is just increments of light, really. Your eyes see far more. When you walk outside, you can look up and see the palest sky, and you can also see the darkest rock. A camera can't do that. And the best example to think of is if you're trying to take a picture of somebody indoors and it's a bright sunny day outside and they're standing in front of a window and you're trying to get them properly exposed, all you're going to have is this white glare behind them. That's all you're going to see in the picture because the camera can't see the detail. It can't see that many steps of detailed light. So one of the techniques I use is called high dynamic range um, and basically what you're doing is you're under it you need a tripod and you generally need something that's either not moving or not moving very quickly and you take a series of pictures and you'll underexpose them a lot and you'll overexpose the same picture a lot and then you'll expose them properly so some pictures will have all the dark details but that's all they'll have because all the light details are totally blown and then Another picture will have all the highlights, but just darkness where the dark areas would be. And you can stitch them together on your computer, put all three images together so you get all the details from the three different pictures or five different pictures. And that's how you end up with pictures that sort of look like that. Yeah, because I always notice, especially on those kind of flat light days, your photos have this uh, vividness to them. It's really for a novice photographer as we're wandering around the museum site here taking photos of <laughs> learned that there's certain days you just don't bother because uh, it's hard to get the, the light correct and the color correct. I find the hardest days to take pictures on are days we haven't had yet when the sun is set <laughs> yeah. all in the sky. It's absolutely <laughs> blue. It's just baking down on you and you go to noon you're going to get really lousy, lousy pictures when you try and do that, in spite of the fact that everything seems bright and it just doesn't work. Was it hard for you to make the shift from the uh, old kind of dark room style photography to all the new gizmos and gadgets? Well, I hadn't done the dark room stuff since I was probably my early 20s or maybe even a little bit earlier. I just sent pictures out and got them developed. I, I shot a lot of slides, like I said, because I loved Kodachrome and it was just easier. Was like a development. <laughs> yeah. But digital, I, I know some, I, the answer is no, I have no problem going to digital. I begged and pleaded with my wife to buy me a digital camera on some milestone birthday, which she did. And then um, I just got the bug, I guess, and I just started taking pictures like a mad fool. And 
And you place. told me it was really that experience of going through all your old Whistler photos that really yeah. got you wound up to start taking a lot of photos of things at Pemberton and events and changes to Pemberton. Yeah, like I kind of thinking, you know, at best I'm sort of making a scrapbook that might be interesting 50 years from now. Well, um, the museum's sure grateful for your scrapbook. <laughs> <laughs> the Western Museum and the Pemberton Museum. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I still, when I stop to think about it, you know, the fact that you can go out and take a picture of somebody and then send it to somebody on the other side of the world five minutes later and they can see exactly the same image that you're looking at is astonishing. Yeah. 